a sapient and intelligent species of mammalian origin. Sector R683923, the star's designation of which their home planet orbit is officially called R12, but they almost exclusively call it by the local name, Sol. The name which they gave their planet is plain and simple, Earth. They are an interesting species that managed to evolve and prosper at a remarkable speed. For most species, the point of the Industrial Revolution to first contact normally lasts about 1,000 years. But for them, from the advent of the first efficient mechanical power source to the first rocket was barely 200 years. And after that, the rate of progress is incredible. The way that humans can adapt to new environments and technologies is rare, if not exclusive in the sector, if not the galactic community. Despite that knack for adaptability and widely known renown for inhabiting planets deemed uninhabitable by most other species, as well as their prowess in combat, they are peaceful and diplomatic species, preferring to talk things out rather than raise their weapons at the slightest insult or minor crisis. Their entrance into the galactic community was gradual. When we discovered them about 500 years ago, we thought that in a few thousand years, they are going to be advanced enough technologically and socially to enter the community. We were proven wrong only a few centuries later when they landed the first of their species on their closest celestial body, their moon. At that point, we initiated Law 268, which in short means that their system including those neighbouring it are to be demilitarised and any major outposts abandoned or shrunk to minimise the effect of our presence on their development. As the years went by and first contact was established, they became honoured members of the galactic community. Nonetheless, we proceeded with caution. At that point, we had little knowledge of their history. We did observe them for a better part of half a millennium in their calendar. But still, the details were few and far between. And even after we came into contact, their history was not widely known, only studied by a few scholars who are either specialized or interested in that field. The story of how they became the most feared race known so far starts with a simple and small colony. About 100 years after we had first contact, they managed to colonize many systems and planets. Among the first ones is also the farthest from their home planet, officially known as R67-4. It has earned the nickname Iceball from the humans due to its harsh and cold climate. Despite that fact, it was settled, though in very small numbers. It served as a valuable stop for passing ships, the planet itself was rich in metals and had a rapidly expanding mining industry. The population at its peak was 3.7 million. Considering the size of the planet was equivalent to the planet called Mars in their home system, slightly larger, the population was relatively small. The atmosphere had oxygen, surprisingly enough, around 10%. But with the expansion of industry and terraforming efforts, that was raised to around 15%. Still not quite enough to support human life, but enough for them to not suffocate immediately. Iceball was settled by humans who were primarily from the northern parts of Earth. Those subgroups or tribes were called Germanics, Slavs and Canadians. Though the latter is not in any subgroup of a tribe, they are still one of the primary settlers to the colony. The colony itself was in the border region of human space. In that particular sector, they bordered the nation of the Alcoxon Dictat, a mammalian species like the humans. They were known to have a short fuse when it comes to debate. Ah, uh, fervently defending their stance on certain matters, that is clearly a cultural remnant of the old, militaristic empire that ruled most of their home planet. Combine that with a rich warrior culture, and you've got quite a volatile species that is prone to outbursts. 
Despite that, they remained in peace for most of their history. Galactic history, that is. Other than a few border skirmishes with their neighbours, there was never a major conflict that erupted with the Alcoxan diktat. That was soon to change, though. Before the arrival of humans, the planet Iceball had an Alcoxan research base on it. Before it was abandoned, just before the integration of the humans into the community. When Alcoxan leaders dug up that fact, according to their law of ownership and honour, they were the rightful owners of that planet. At first, offers came to the humans to sell them the planet for a reasonable sum of money. It was considered by the human leaders, but promptly declined when the demand for a population transfer was brought up. The Alcoxans wanted the human population of Iceball deported in its entirety, though it was possible on the part of the humans, and the population was at no threat of becoming homeless. Out of principle, they refused. The human leadership was not willing to deport their citizens from their homes en masse. They had a counter-offer that stated that the humans on the planet stay, but the Alcoxan diktat must guarantee the rights and safety of the humans who inhabit the planet. The offer was refused. The Alcoxans, in all of their boldness and arrogance, refused. The talks of sale of the planet lasted for months neither side willing to compromise. Then tensions escalated when an Alcoxan diplomat planted an Alcoxan flag when visiting the planet, proclaiming that this is the territory of the Alcoxan diktat. The humans demanded an apology and that the diplomat, the adequately punished for stirring conflict, the local population was also tense. Other than the majority of the human population, there was a minority of Alcoxans mostly consisting of traders, most of whom only resided there for a limited time. A few weeks after the flag incident, a disgruntled human miner was allegedly ripped off on a purchase of a ship from an Alcoxan trader. The man saved up for years in order to afford a ship. In the end, the ship was found to be faulty and the costs of repair were higher than the price of the ship itself. You can blame the human partially for not being cautious when buying something that is that life-changing. But it is also on the Alcoxon trader who put a faulty vessel for sale at full price. The human miner accused the Alcoxon trader of ripping him off, and the heated argument escalated to the point of violence. It is unclear who attacked first. But in the end, the Alcoxon was dead and the human was hospitalized. The utter chaos that ensued couldn't be stopped by either side. The Alcoxans demanded monetary compensation and imprisonment of the human, who they claimed attacked first. The humans insisted that the trader was the one who had to be punished, if he were alive, that is, and that it is his fault for ripping people off to that extent that a man's entire life savings were squandered. Without the possibility of returning the faulty vessel, tensions escalated further when the Alcoxan military entered human space. A few frigates were sent without prior permission of the human government as peacekeeping forces. This was received with backlash from not just the humans, but also the galactic community at large. Progressively, more aggressive rhetoric was spewed by both sides. Mediators from other nations were sent to ease the tensions. The Alcoxans were forced to withdraw their forces from human space, and it was replaced with a small and mixed fleet from various other nations. When everyone thought that things calmed down and that the issue could be resolved in a peaceful manner, a local human politician who wanted the system and the planet to stay part of the Terran Republic was assassinated. The perpetrator was unknown, but almost everyone knew who it was. The Alcoxans. Whether it was a lone wolf or a government-sanctioned assassin was unknown, but it was the deed that spilled the cup. 
After a stern warning from the human government, the Alcoxans replied with an ultimatum. Give us R-67-4. We have given you enough proof that it is ours. We have offered you the chance to sell it. We have offered you a chance of peace, but you have refused us. Now we give you one last chance. Give us our rightful territory. We are still willing to pay you. If not, we will use force to return it. The human response was out of the ordinary. The calm and level-headed replies, with an occasional harsh word, were the routine with the humans. But this was an outright call to war. Come and get it. In the first hours, the galactic community tried to mediate the issue and try to make peace, but to no avail. The fleets of both respective nations had mobilized and readied themselves for conflict. The galactic community could only sit and watch as the chaos unfolded. The human fleets were inferior in number and technology to the Alcoxans, and Alcoxan victory was expected. The first battle went exactly like that. Decisive Alcoxan victory. The occupation of Iceball began. Peacekeeping units from the community were sent to the planet to oversee the occupation. It was expected that the morale of the local population would be low, and their will to resist non-existent. We were wrong once again, completely wrong. The local population armed themselves and resisted with all of their strength and might. Despite their low numbers, they had one massive advantage. They were home, and their home was massive compared to their population. And what we learned about humans quite quickly is that you do not enter a human house without their permission. After nearly a month of fighting resistance, the Alcoxans decided to blockade the planet, only allowing supplies for their own troops. They did that in the hope to starve the population to the point where they would give up. Once more, they were proven wrong. The local population already had some agricultural production in hydroponic plants, as well as a large supply of food in case of a situation just like this. But still, it wasn't infinite. The fighting lasted for another month on the planet. The human government was pressured not to enter the occupied territory and to re-establish talks with the Alcoxans. They refused after that attempt to revive diplomacy between the two nations. A report came from the peacekeeping troops. A human brought an overwhelming amount of evidence of unlawful and harsh treatment of prisoners and the local population from the Alcoxans. Torture, executions, and various other abhorrent things. What riled up the human government and the entirety of the human population was the human that brought the message. The man allegedly escaped an Alcoxon prison camp, which was under the peacekeeper's supervision. Corruption and incompetence were at play, and with little clothing protecting him, he evaded Alcoxon patrols and trekked through freezing conditions with no oxygen tank for 50 kilometers to the nearest peacekeeping outpost. How he managed to locate it is a mystery. How he managed to survive is an even bigger one. When the human arrived, he barely stood on his feet, his fingers frozen shut around a bag that held the evidence of the mistreatment of the prisoners and population. When the soldiers saw him and attempted to aid him, he collapsed. All attempts at resuscitation failed. The humans call it the power of will, a power that enables humans to defy their biology and evidently the laws of nature in order to survive. An incredibly interesting, if not terrifying, topic of discussion that was brought up for years to come. After a bombshell such as that was revealed, the galactic community was horrified by the things listed, the pictures and the videos. Many threatened sanctions and embargoes for the Alcoxans. Others couldn't afford to do so because of the industrial exports of the Alcoxan diktat. Many nations would stand to lose much 
if they put sanctions on the Alcoxans. Meanwhile, the humans decided to take things into their own hands. The blatant disregard of human life, diplomacy, and everything that the human moral code stood for brought them to the breaking point. They ignored orders, preferring sanctions rather than inaction. The human fleet came into the system with all its might. Neutral fleets tried to hail them and ordered them to turn back. But the orders were ignored. They couldn't do anything but stand and watch, as one of the most brutal battles in recorded galactic history transpired before their very eyes. Rammings, suicide attacks, mass bombardment, attempted genocide on the surface of Iceball. The total disregard of all laws of warfare from both sides was something to behold. The humans proved to be much more brutal and merciless than the Alcoxans in battle, giving up their lives in order to so much as damage Alcoxan armor. Despite all of the odds stacked up against the humans, they won. But it was a Pyrrhic victory. Hundreds of thousands lay dead, the system of R-67 became a graveyard of ships, and a graveyard of many humans and Alcoxans. The battle for the control of the planet itself was quick. The Alcoxan army was overwhelmed by the human land forces. Relentless offensives on Alcoxan positions, constant bombardment, and absolute destruction of the infrastructure. Both sides had to drive or march through blizzards a knee-high snow if aerial travel was unavailable, with temperatures reaching as low as 80 degrees Celsius, 112 Fahrenheit, at some parts of the front. After a few more grueling weeks of combat on the surface, the planet was finally back in human hands. The rest is history. But there are lessons we have learned when watching this conflict. Never underestimate your enemy. Human will is something you can't easily destroy. You can feed it when they march on just to spite you. And by studying their history further, I learned that this trait is universal. It is in all humans. And by far the most terrifying prospect is the ease at which they unite to accomplish one goal. All civilizations require cooperation, yes. But humans, when they see injustice particularly in justice toward their own kind, they will move mountains, drain oceans, and move continents if need be to seek revenge. And no matter how inferior they are technologically and economically, having the rage of an entire race against you, the rage of countless billions, you stand to lose more than you stand to gain.